Rib of blindness is one of the major causes of blindness in the world. These parasites enter the eye and it becomes hard like a marble. And so these people become blind. This you is an audio. People scratch day and night such that often their skin becomes bleeding. It's really driven people to commit suicide. The disease itself is a really insidious disease, basically disabling people right when they should be entering the most productive periods of their lives. It is really something that promotes poverty, decreases their productivity. Children are less likely to go to school. You find men and women being ostracized and socially set apart. Up here in the north, the river blindness situation is terrible. This is the worst thing in the whole country. This femur is positive. The infestation is so big that it calls for an intervention. No crab, no black fly, no black fly, no river blindness. Uganda has elected to go after complete elimination of the parasite. When I heard of that, I thought it was not possible. But now, I think it can be done. Good evening. I'm Craig Withers, Director of Program Support of the Health Programs of the Carter Center. I would like to welcome those joining us here in the audience, as well as our friends watching and tweeting our live webcast of this special Conversations at the Carter Center event on the upcoming documentary, Dark Forest, Black Fly, which chronicles the elimination of river blindness in Uganda. Conversations is a series of discussions held at the Carter Center to discuss Carter Center peace and health efforts and current world affairs. Almost every Conversations event is open to the public. The webcast will be archived on the Carter Center's website for later viewing. We also are covering this event live in our Twitter account using the hashtag ConvosTCC. We will have a question and answer session later this evening. At that time, we'll welcome you to join the discussion by asking a question at one of the microphones on either end of the chapel, or for our web audience by submitting your question through Twitter. The video you have just seen is a trailer for the new independent documentary on the campaign to eliminate river blindness in Uganda called Dark Forest, Black Fly. The film is still in production and will be completed in the summer. Tonight, though, special, never before, never before seen footage and outtakes from the documentary, we will have a special sneak peek at this new film, film and learn about the triumphs and challenges the Carter Center and its partners have faced in their long campaign to help Uganda overcome this debilitating disease. We are pleased to have joining us the executive director of the film and former CNN journalist Gary Stryker, who will moderate tonight's event. Gary Stryker is executive director for Cielo Productions Incorporated, a nonprofit company producing documentary films and news reports on global public health issues for U.S. and international broadcasters. Until 2004, Mr. Stryker was CNN's global environmental correspondent based in Atlanta. On an assignment unique in television journalism, Mr. Stryker traveled the globe reporting on the planet's environmental health. Before becoming a journalist, he was a resident vice president of Citibank in the Africa Regional Office in Nairobi 
Before that, he spent five years as an international legal advisor to the government of Swaziland. He first came to Africa as a volunteer lawyer with the U.S. Peace Corps. Mr. Stryker is joined by Dr. Frank Richards, director of our River Blindness Program, and Dr. Moses Katabarwa, epidemiologist for our health programs. Dr. Frank Richards is an expert in parasitic and tropical diseases who has worked extensively in Latin America and Africa. He currently is director of our river blindness, lymphatic filariasis, and schistosomiasis programs, and co-director of our malaria control program. Since 1996, the river, Pl river blindness program he directs at the Carter Center has helped to provide more than 150 million treatments for river blindness in 11 countries. Dr. Richards came to the Carter Center from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he spent more than 20 years in a career focused on parasitic disease control and eradication in the Americas and Africa. Dr. Richards earned his Bachelor of Arts from Williams College, his medical degree from Cornell University. He completed a residency in pediatrics at the University of Southern California Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and his fellowship in infectious diseases at Emory University. While at CDC, he spent five years in Guatemala and reached the rank of captain in the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service. Dr. Moses Katabarwa is program epidemiologist to the Center's River Blindness, Lymphatic Filariasis, and Schistosomiasis programs. Trained in anthropology and public health, Dr. Katabara studies the importance of community structures in the delivery of health services. Native to Uganda, Dr. Katabara served as country director for the Carter Center's Uganda office from 1996 to 2003. He also directed the World Bank World Health Organization sponsored program to control river blindness in 11 of 18 endemic areas of Uganda. Programs that continue to achieve treatment coverage of 90% annually. Dr. Katabarwa earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Makere University in Uganda. He has a master's degree and a doctorate in anthropology from Commonwealth Open University in the United Kingdom. He received his master's of public health degree from Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in 1997. Please welcome Gary, Frank, and Moses. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, everyone, for coming to see this um, presentation. As you heard, uh, I'm with Cielo Productions, which is a nonprofit production company specializing in global health documentaries and news. We believe that um, global health is the moral imperative of our time. We think it's time that everyone, as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uses in its slogan, everyone has the right to a healthy and productive life. I can't find a better way to state our mission than, uh, than that. We believe that by producing documentaries and, and news stories about global health challenges and uh, solutions, that we can build awareness and support for the global health movement worldwide. Because if there's no awareness, if there's no support among the electorates in the industrialized, developed world, there will be little support for the funding requirements to support global health campaigns like the one that the Carter Center is involved with in the River Blindness Campaign, Guinea Worm Campaign malaria work, 
neglected tropical diseases in general. And without the kind of media support that should be given by, say, mainstream media, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the support levels that are needed for, for global health campaigns. As you know, we have got, we've got serious economic problems here. There's a lot of talk in Congress about slashing foreign aid, global health programs. It's getting serious. So we have this challenge uh, facing us. We're producing documentary films. Uh, last year at the um, Conversations event, there were some clips shown from our first film on guinea worm disease. This is the second film that we've got coming out. The first film has been recut into a public television uh, one hour format, and that will be running on public television stations starting in April under uh, a new banner that we, we set up, a new brand called Global Health Frontiers. Our aim is to release at least one, maybe two documentaries each year on a global health topic from the front lines. Uh, the first three that um, we're producing. The first one was guinea worm, then there's this one, river blindness. We have another one coming up after that about trachoma in um, Ethiopia. In each of these, we've collaborated with the Carter Center to produce these stories because the Carter Center is on the cutting edge of the campaigns to, to deal with those diseases. So it's been a healthy, fruitful collaboration with the Carter Center for the past five years. Each of these documentaries has consumed about three years of field shooting and post-production work. Uh, it's not easy to get into many of these locations where this field work is taking place, places like southern Sudan, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Ghana, and other countries. And we try to track the work that's being done on these campaigns, in these campaigns, over time. So we have to keep going back, you know, one assignment after another. It's, it's time consuming, it's um, tedious. Often things do not happen when we expect them to happen. We have to go back again and catch them when they're happening. You've got dry seasons and rainy seasons to take into account. And, Everything has to happen in accordance with the, the plans that the campaigns have set up to carry on their work. Um, if you're working in the guinea worm program or the river blindness program, you don't do what you're doing simply because we show up to, uh, to film it. So we have to be there when things are happening. So as I said, um, you know, our mission is to try to get these stories out to the general public, to opinion leaders, policy makers, to make them understand what's involved in these global health campaigns. Um, if, we, if we carry out the work that we hope to achieve over the next few years, we're, we're hoping that we'll make a decent impression on our viewers, people will, be, will become more accustomed to seeing what is involved in global health work in developing countries. The principal thing we want people to understand is that unlike in the past, you know, we've got our world and they, <laughs> they in these developing countries have got their world. They've got diseases to worry about. We can't really do much about that. Those, those are obsolete ideas. We realize now that in the global health movement that there is a huge amount of difference that we can make in developing nations, in impoverished countries, in the villages at the end of the road where science and technology rarely shows up. There are things that we can do with science and technology and innovative techniques to make a huge difference in people's lives. This river blindness 
story is a good example of that. And every story that we've worked on so far does show how the Carter Center is able to take these ideas, this knowledge, the medicines, the innovative techniques, the technology, to make these huge differences in, in people's lives. It is possible for us to ease the suffering, to even eliminate diseases that not too long ago were considered to be just the lot in life that people in developing countries had to put up with. And of course, for us, whether these diseases continue, whether the people in these developing nations continue to suffer and continue to lead the, the lives they're leading with unrealized potential. It affects our security, it affects our prosperity. You know, a healthy world globally inures to our benefit and it makes a difference in our lives, makes a difference in the stability of the countries where the, these people are found. If they can realize their potential and lead prosperous, healthy lives, it will benefit us in the long run. If for no other reason, that, then uh, eventually, if things get so bad in some of these countries, we will have to bail them out one way or another, either epidemics of disease or famines, or we'll have to deal with immigration, people leaving their countries because life is so desperate, they're going to seek a better life elsewhere. So in response to the question, why should we care about these diseases in places like Uganda or Sudan or any place else where these persisting diseases torment people, um, the answer is that, you know, it's in our benefit, it's to our benefit. We will uh, prosper as a result if they lead happier and healthier lives. The um, river blindness story is focused on Uganda. Uganda is just one country that has uh, to deal with this disease. It's spread out in other parts of Africa and in Latin America. But we chose Uganda because it's it's got a very special situation compared to other African countries. It has made the commitment to eliminate the disease. It has a special uh, situation with regard to the insect vector that transmits the disease. It's made tremendous progress over the last 30 years dealing with river blindness more than 30 years actually. It's wiped out the disease in some parts of the country. It's made tremendous progress with the medicines available, with its community-directed uh, treatment programs, but it also has a very serious situation in one part of the country, in the north. It's just as bad as any place we've ever seen it in, um, in other parts of Africa. So it's a good, it's a good prism to look at river blindness as a whole by focusing on Uganda. So that's what we're doing. We're telling the story of Uganda, but in the process, like we did with guinea worm disease in the first film, we're going to give you the definitive story of, guinea, of uh, river blindness, explain what the disease is, where it's found, how it's being treated, how close we are to seeing the end of it. And we're going, to, we're going to run a few clips from the, the film to give you an idea of what the disease is all about. And then we will have a uh, discussion with uh, Frank and Moses after that. And um, we'll have another clip after that with some more discussion. And then we'll take questions and answers. So if you're ready to uh, run the clip, let's uh, proceed with the uh, first six minutes or so from the film Dark Forest Black Fly. I've worked with the River Blindness Program for over 15 years. River Blindness is a terrible disease. I have personally seen so many people suffering from it. It can actually 
this way one was life. In northern Uganda, almost everyone in the village of Angagura is affected by river blindness disease. Each person raising a hand has suffered from it, men, women, and children. The disease started in 1995. It has affected his eyes. He cannot see. He cannot do the normal work he has been doing before. And there's serious itching all over the body. River blindness is the common name for onchocerciasis, a disease caused by microscopic parasitic worms, Onchocerca volvulus. The worms migrate under the skin, causing a disfiguring condition people here call leopard skin, accompanied by severe, intense itching. It's difficult to describe this level of itching because it's really reputedly has driven people to commit suicide. You can itch and itch to the point that you're tending to get hold of bits of metal to scratch yourself you know, and gouge your body and you, you become irrational. And if you've got it, it, there is a social stigma to it. So it's very damaging, especially for say a young woman if she develops these signs early in life, she, she's not really marriageable. She said it started when they were in the field digging. Uh, the flies have been biting them several times. Then he started seeing some small worm moving in the eyes like this. Then after the worm disappeared, she cannot see. You just see every part is white. How has her husband reacted to this? The husband has refused her because she's blind. She's alone now. The disease itself is a really insidious disease because of all the socioeconomic impacts that it has basically disabling people right when they should be entering the most productive periods of their lives. This is another one. This is a nodule. nodule. Distinctive nodules under the skin, anywhere on the body, are another sign of the disease. The worms that cause river blindness are transmitted to humans by the bites of tiny but aggressive black flies that breed in fast-flowing streams and rivers. That's how the disease got its name. This Nyamwamba River is a perfect place for black fly breeding. You see rapidly flowing water over rocks. You see bubbling, which indicates that the water is very well oxygenated. And you see little bits of reeds and green areas where the black flies also like to lay their eggs. So this is, uh, when you look here, you, you automatically say, ah, river blindness, because this is a perfect breeding site for a black fly. Dr. Frank Richards and parasitologist Moses Katabara work for the Atlanta-based Carter Center, a partner with Uganda's government in its river blindness program. Well, the Carter Center works in partnership with the Ministry of Health. Oh, hello. President Carter has given river blindness a high priority. Uh, he's very, very interested in the ability to use uh, the medicine ivermectin and other tools to stop the transmission of river blindness. In Uganda, what we're doing is we're providing resources and technical assistance to the Ministry of Health in their effort to eliminate river blindness. I'm a fly catcher. They like these parts. 
<laughs> Probably basically because the upper part is, is covered. <laughs> so they go for these parts. Can you feel, feel it? it? Yeah, it's painful. It bites, then after some time stops, I think sucks blood. And then when that goes low, then it bites again so it can get more. That's, that's how I'm feeling it. Now imagine if you have a thousand <laughs> feasting on you. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think we ought to start uh, with Frank. If you could explain a little bit about the disease, I'm picking up from what we saw in the clips. What, what is this disease all about, and why is it something that should be a priority for elimination? Um, thanks, Gary, and thanks, thanks everyone for coming out tonight to conversations at the, at the Carter Center. I, um, I'd like to pick up from, from the clip and, and just explain a little bit more about the, the life cycle, um, because it really helps to, to understand what the, the biology and what the challenges are. Uh, there are the black flies, which we've talked a lot about. There are the worms we've talked a lot about. And then there are the people that we've talked uh, not enough about. We've talked about the disease. Um, but people are a key uh, part of this because they're not necessarily completely innocent bystanders. It's very easy to sort of think of, oh, this worm sort of lives in the, in the rivers and in the environment, and the flies come out of the river and they bite the people, and the people are the bystanders who get infected. That's not quite it. Um, while, while people can catch river blindness, certainly from the black flies, uh, they're also the key driver. They cause river blindness. And that's because the worms that cause it, that you saw in some of the pictures, only occur in human beings. And it's really the black fly that picks the worm up from one person and takes it to the next. So if you had a situation where you had black flies, but you had no people with no worms, you would have no river blindness. That's, that's a very, very important point. So if you can get rid of the infection, the worms, and people, then the black flies will not transmit and the disease will, will go away. Um, the other thing, going to the people and the worms, uh, you saw these pictures of, uh, of people who had lumps in their skin. They called nodules. Well, in those nodules, uh, the worms, the adult form of the worms, Anchocerca volvulus, live. That's where they are. If you were to do surgery and take out one of those nodules and cut it open, uh, you would get the adult form of the worm that is in a coil, all coiled up. They're male and female worms living inside of those nodules. If you were to stretch the worms out, they would be about 18 inches long. So, that, that is, is, is where the tiny worms that you saw in the blood and swarming around under the microscope, those are actually the embryos. And they come uh, out of the female worms that live in the nodules. And they swarm under the skin, causing itching. And then they can get into your eyes, causing eye disease and, and blindness. They also, as they're swarming under the skin, as you saw Moses exposing his leg to the uh, black flies, they're picked up by the black flies. And only in the black flies do they make a transformation where they're now able to grow up to be an adult worm. So the babies that are produced, the embryos, are stuck underneath the skin unless they go into a black fly. They cannot grow up to be adult worms. So this curious biology is a, a very, very important point to, to understand when we talk about people giving river blindness to other people and people getting river blindness from the black flies. Uh, the, the next thing I'd like to talk about then is, is uh, inside of the people, uh, these embryonic worms, these what we call microfilaria. This is the subject of treating people with this medicine that is donated by Merck called Mectazan. The scientific name is Ivermectin. Um, Merck has been given, giving this, uh, this donation uh, as pioneers in what we call pharmacophilanthropy. They've been donating this medicine. The value is about $1.50 a tablet. And they have donated uh, close to 2 million tablets since they announced the donation in 1987. They're, they're actually celebrating their, uh, their 25th, or actually their, their uh, that 25th anniversary. 
I should know because it's the, I was married in 1987, so there's my wife, and we're celebrating our 25th. We, we got married when the donation took place. <laughs> Couldn't do this without you, Sherry. Um, so the medicine, uh, these tablets, kill the microfilaria, the tiny embryonic worms that get into the eyes, cause the skin disease, get into the flies, and transmit. That's what the medicine does. But the medicine does not kill the adult worms that I told you stretched out to 18 inches that live under the skin. Therefore, the medicine is, has to be given repetitively. It's not like you can just treat somebody and immediately cure them of the adult worms, and you have to give repetitive treatment. I, I liken it to the flu shot. Uh, every year we know we have to get the flu shot to keep from getting the flu. It's the same way in these communities. Every year people need to be treated with a medicine to keep from getting the infection. If you, entreat, if you treat more intensely or if you go after controlling the vector, uh, then not only do you keep people from getting the disease, but you keep people from infecting other people and the parasites ultimately die out and you can move to a phase that we call elimination. So the last thing I'd like to do is to distinguish between control and elimination. Control is essentially you have to give this medicine to a person forever. They won't get skin disease. They won't go blind. But the transmission cycle still continues, so the infection continues, and you have to keep this going forever. If you go after elimination, then you have to go after the black fly bit. You have to stop new worms from getting back into people and you have to interrupt that transmission cycle. That is the key difference uh, between a control program and an elimination program. And the really neat thing about Uganda is that um, uh, the Ugandan government decided they wanted to get rid of this once and for all and go for the elimination campaign. And uh, that's what the Carter Center, uh, being the, the risk takers that, that we are, uh, signed on as partners. Um, in hoping uh, to, to help them reach that very important goal. Just one point about the uh, drug ivermectin. This ivermectin compound that was discovered in a soil sample from a Japanese golf course by a scientist working in Merck's veterinary division. They discovered that this ivermectin would actually kill the parasites that cause heartworm. Uh, in um, dogs and, and horses and, and other animals. And the scientists that discovered this realized that uh, river blindness, the, the parasite that causes river blindness in humans, is very similar to the heartworm parasite. So they decided, why don't we give that a try about 30 years ago? And then step by step with the trials, they discovered that this drug could actually kill these microfilaria, these baby worms, in humans. Before that, the only way that science uh, or health officials, uh, could, the only way they could control river blindness was to beat down the flies, the, the, the vectors, the carriers of the disease. This discovery by Merck revolutionized the whole river blindness movement by giving people a drug that they could administer to people to kill these worms inside the human host. Moses, can you explain why River blindness is so important from the standpoint of, of global health, because it doesn't kill. It, it, it does cause blindness in many places, but usually it's a skin disease, isn't it? And should we really be concerned in, the, in, the whole, in looking at the whole spectrum of global health and, and the diseases you compare it to malaria, HIV, AIDS, you know, tuberculosis, and other diseases? Why, how does river blindness impact villages, people in um, places like Uganda that, that require us to take it seriously and try to eliminate it? Well, first of all, you each intense itchiness minute by minute, day and night, year by year, there's no stop, no stopping scratching. And then if you are that person who cuts your nails that can't provide enough scratch, uh, scratching to, to ease the itchiness. So they actually go for stones, <laughs> and when the stones are not enough and they're actually bleeding now, sometimes they boil water and pour it on their skin. 
And I've seen, I've witnessed this kind of thing. So it doesn't kill, but when it gets you there and you are no longer irra irrational in your thinking, um, then it becomes a serious problem. Then the fact that you are <coughs> scratching, you are actually injuring your skin and you're exposing yourself to secondary infections. And, and, um, and that's why you sometimes you see their skin is, looks dirty and whatnot, but there are other bacterial infections in that skin. Mm -hmm. And then the children don't go to school. Uh, these guys live in pristine environments because river blindness does not exist where there is pollution. Productive areas, yet they can't produce because they are busy scratching themselves. Um, so, if you are covering, uh, let's say 50 percent, uh, let's say 30 percent of Uganda is affected by this disease, that means that there is minimum um, production in those areas, though they, although they are the most fertile areas in the country, and that's what is happening almost across Africa where river blindness is endemic. And so um, that's, that's the reason we, we, we must um, control or eliminate this disease in the case of Uganda where they have launched elimination. But remember also um, where there is river blindness, um, there are other resources that would help the community to develop, for example, tourism. Uh, in the case of Uganda, where there are mountain gorillas that attract tourists, this is where the disease is. So where we have eliminated transmission, uh, people are involved in um, guiding tourists and whatnot, agriculture, um, they're involved in um, harvesting forest re resources. And if we don't control or eliminate this disease, um, all these, uh, the production will remain low in those areas, and the benefits we get, and they also get, we, we can't get them. Just, just to pick up, I, I think it, it, this river blindness falls into an interesting category called the neglected tropical diseases in, in the lingo, the NTDs. And the reason that these conditions are neglected, even though we actually have new technology that could go a long way to controlling or even eliminating them, as we're talking about tonight. The reason that they're neglected is that they're not lethal, number one. They don't occur in incredible epidemics. They basically involve the poorest of the poor. A lot of people say they shouldn't be called neglected tropical diseases. They should be called diseases of neglected people because actually these are people without political influence, outside of the money economy, uh, a disease which is not epidemic, it generally does not affect tourism, um, except in areas where there are the mountain gorillas. And uh, so that if you go to these areas, it's hard to say, oh, we can't put an army in there because they'll come down with Anko, as opposed to we can't put an army in there because they'll come down with malaria. Uh, so the military's not worried about it, tourism isn't worried about it. So I really think we've reached a point where um, enlightened self-interest, the enlightened self-interest argument that you mentioned earlier, uh, oh, we don't want this disease coming here or Ebola or some awful outbreak that affects us. Really, we're, we're, we're looking at this as we should do something about this because we can do something about this. We have the tools available. Um, the countries are behind doing something like this. People suffer. They don't die, but they suffer. We ought to be about trying to find a way to do this. I'm really proud to be at the Carter Center because President Carter has been interested. We like to say uh, we haven't been neglecting neglected tropical diseases for 25 years. So really the Carter Center from the guinea worm campaign, from the river blindness campaign, which started in 1996, um, have, have really focused on these conditions because they've been largely ignored. And, and the Carter Center, as part of our ethos, thinks we ought to be uh, concerned about things like this that, uh, that in areas that others aren't working. Uh, <clears throat> Moses, the Carter Center has some basic principles that it follows in fighting disease. 
Can you explain how these principles are followed in the case of river blindness uh, in, in Uganda? Well, one of the main ones that I would like to talk to is that we, the Carter Center is willing to take risks. Uh, they, are, they are not afraid of failure. And this is something that the international community used to say river blindness cannot be eliminated. And so they say, let's continue controlling. But uh, we have only the one tool which the international community is using, and that's ivermectin. So suppose something happens to ivermectin, what happens? As Dr. Frank Richard said, the control program is almost indefinite. And so if that tool, we, if we no longer have that tool, what next? So the Carter Center decide to pattern, take a risk pattern with the government of Uganda and, and uh, prove that uh, river blindness can be eliminated, at least in, in, some, in, some, in a number of fossa in Africa. Um, but we know that if you eliminate uh, river blindness in some of these areas, you are reducing the area under river blindness. And the more you reduce, the easier it becomes. And, uh, and, and so the Carter Center is willing to take that risk. Doesn't the Carter Center also rely to a large extent in almost all of its programs on community-directed, volunteer-driven uh, work that actually does the, uh, the program, you know, work in, in the field? Isn't this something? In this particular case, it's community-directed treatment with ivermectin, isn't it? Well, I think one of the, the uh, important parts of the, the ivermectin donation is that these, these medicines are, are really very, very safe um, and uh, in addition to being effective. So that the, the community directedness is the notion that community volunteers um, can become uh, engaged in distributing the medicine after and, and providing health education after being appropriately tra trained under the Ministry of Health um, and uh, obviously uh, under continued supervision. The, important part though is that that communities are able to have a degree of flexibility within certain standards in terms of deciding when treatment would be best to take place uh, how that treatment should be organized um, and that uh, lends to a, a kind of empowerment at that level um, that is uh, that's very edifying uh, and not only for the for the river blindness program in particular but other health uh, initiatives that, that can be built onto that that the, once these river blindness programs have been established. And Moses has been involved um, in some of his work with, with a modification of that, that effort that we call uh, the kinship approach. Yeah, and, and that really fits into the conditions we find in uh, uh, low resource communities or in the developing world, where, for example, in the case of Uganda, we have one doctor to over 20,000 20, people, a nurse, one for about 8,000. And the health units are not well distributed. So people still walk 10 kilometers to go, and some of them go 20 kilometers to go to access a health unit. So if you are going to rely on professionals based at health units, forget you will, you will never do anything because they are, they are already overwhelmed in the clinics. And, so they, and then they are, the larger part of the community is still there, not served. So, we, so that's why Carter Center um, involves communities in their own health. And that fits in the cultural <laughs> Uh, way of how the rural people look at it. They want to get involved in everything that affects their lives. And especially when you involve the kinship, the traditional kinship system. And we always talk about the traditional African kinship system as if in places like America there are no kinships. That's not true. There are kinships here, <laughs> except that with urbanization you are mixed up so much. But in the case of Uganda and other African communities, <coughs> geographically, 
uh, people who are blood related stay in some geographical enclaves. You can call them kinship zones. And if you use kinships, then you involve women can operate without hindrance. You hear of social scientists thinking, saying that uh, like the male, in Africa, the, the males are dominant and the females are downtrodden. But if you involve the kinships, you realize that the, uh, the, the, women, the level of involvement of women exceeds that of men because they are working in a, a protected environment. And, and then, again, medicine. When medicine is brought in, it's equi uh, equi uh, health services are equitably provided. Uh, if you are disabled and you are within your kinship, they will give you medicine. And then you don't go on strike because someone did not provide you a cash incentives, then you cannot treat your mother or your sister or your father or your brother. Uh, those are your insurance. Money is not insurance. But your kinsmen are your insurance. And treating them is an obligation. It's not something nice. It's, it's to protect yourself too. And if you don't take medicine, <clears throat> then they have a way, if you can't just find one taking the medicine, they have a way of getting you to take it. And, and while in the, the, health, the health workers, if you refuse, they can't do anything. But your kinsmen have a right on how, what you do and how you should do it. <laughs> and, uh, and so the kinship is the naturally the best uh, uh, structure to introduce uh, health services in the communities. Not, not just river blindness, but also other uh, uh, control of other diseases. Okay, we're about ready to get into the next clip, but I wanted to uh, point out uh, in respect of this ivermectin donation, you know, Merck Pharmaceutical uh, has been donating this drug now for almost 25 years. It has literally cost them billions of dollars. This has been a, you know, trailblazing philanthropic effort by Merck, obviously they're getting goodwill out of it, but it has cost them money, and I think there are people in the Merck company at a higher level who probably have given this a second thought after they made that decision, but they've stuck to it for 25 years. They ship these drugs to any country that needs it. They've made the pledge. For as long as they need it, they will provide these drugs. The problem is that they will deliver to the port or to the capital city that's the end of it. It's up to that host country to take those drugs and get them out to the people who need them. They need the money, they need the manpower, they need the logistics, they need all of this planning to get those drugs to the end of the road to the villages that need it. That has been the big problem in, in the, the uh, ivermectin distribution. That is what the Carter Center has been involved with. That's, you know, the name of the game is distributing these drugs and getting them out to the villages using the kinship system, using all the available tools to make sure that these drugs are given to everybody who needs it either once or twice a year you know, mm -hmm. on schedule. So we're going to take a look now at, um, at a clip that'll give you an idea of the special situation that Uganda has in respect of the vector, the, the, the principal vector, the fly in the country that transmits river blindness. It's a special uh, subspecies or species that uh, does transmit the disease, but it's, it's easier to control. It's not like the same fly, not, it's not like the fly that, that transmits the disease in other parts of Africa. And that, that is what gives Uganda a little bit of an edge over other countries in trying to control it. So, Billy, if we can roll that now and... In most parts of Africa where river blindness is found, in the open savannas, 
The fly that transmits the disease lays its eggs in running water, the larvae attaching to floating vegetation or rocks. Emerging from underwater as flying adults, they can range far from breeding sites in search of blood meals. Strong savanna winds can carry them hundreds of miles. Controlling a vector like that on a large scale seems nearly impossible. A major reason why river blindness programs in West Africa have now moved away from vector control to rely mainly on treatment with ivermectin to break transmission of the disease. Yes, the river is down here. We are going to do the trapping. But in Uganda, most river blindness is transmitted by a different species of fly, and that opens an opportunity. Uganda is unique in that it has a kind of black fly that we call Simulium nevi. And Simulium nevi has a, a, a fragile life cycle, much more fragile than other parts of Africa. You know, on onchocerciasis is a problem in this focus. And uh, here, the vector of the disease is Simulium nevi. Make sure that it's tight. When it's tight like this, then push the meat inside the trap. Most likely, I'm seeing this place as the best place for trapping. So I will cover it. So from here, we shall wait for one hour. Then after one hour, we get out the trap to see what has been caught. In Uganda, Controlling black flies is still an important part of the river blindness program, and highly experienced vector control teams are active in stopping the flies from breeding. They can do this because these flies, Simulium nevi, depend on freshwater crabs to complete their life cycle. So when we are looking for the early stages, the immature stages of the vector fly Simulium nevi, they are always found in the joints, in the joints here. Wow. Yeah. Then, as they, they mature, they, they are found around the body here. Mm -hmm. And they always move from one, one place to another. This is a lava. One, two, three, four. This was a pupa, because when I pressed it, I crushed it, unfortunately. So, five, six, Seven, you can see the love here, you can see them, you can see it here. The black fly lays its eggs in water, the eggs hatch, and the little wormy things we call larvae must swim around and find a crab. If they don't find a crab, they'll die. If they find a crab, they can get on that crab, insist, form pupae, and from the pupae emerge the adult black fly, which is responsible for the transmission of river blindness. No crab, no black fly, no black fly, no river blindness. Okay. This is a female you checked. The fly's essential relationship with crabs allows a simple method for locating fly breeding sites, catching crabs, and examining them for the larvae or pupae of developing flies. After trapping these crabs, we have found out actually the crabs are heavily infested with the other stages when breeding sites are found, the vector control teams apply doses of larvicide in the stream or river. You can just see the logistical challenges just glancing upstream here and seeing that three kilometers upstream, you're going to have to do exactly what's taking place here. And the same three kilometers downstream from here. So you can imagine the kind of time and dedication it takes to do that, it's very tough work. Is that the rain? It's raining. Wouldn't be a rainforest if it didn't rain. So now they're gonna apply in a pump fashion the abate and a spray in the calculations that we just did to uh, give the correct dosage. Treatments on this river began about a year ago. First, what we did was we 
came and we tested the crabs to see if they were infected, and indeed they were. Stage of larva of Somalia amnivai. Over 90% of the crabs which we collected here had the larval or pupal stages of the black fly, so it was a hot zone. We began dosing monthly and then checking the crabs also monthly. We started this program, 90% of them had something on Over 90%. Yes. Yeah. And we found that now, in the last three months, we have not found a single infected crab, which indicate that the abate is doing what it's supposed to do. It's not hurting the crabs, but it is stopping the black fly. Okay, Frank, can you say something about um, these vector control teams? This is really a, a valuable asset that Uganda has. Uh, there's a bit of a history behind this, right? Sure. These guys are knowledgeable, they're hardworking, they know what they're doing, and um, it's made a huge difference in Uganda's campaign, hasn't it? Sure. Before I get to that, though, I, I just coming back to my love of biology, I, I want to, uh, a minute ago, I talked about the the people, the worms, and the, uh, the black flies, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the black flies. I think you got a, a bit of that in the piece on how uh, uh, when we say black fly, that really means just a whole host of different um, uh, species within the, the genus Simulium. And uh, they behave very differently. They're constructed very differently uh, anatomically. Uh, and, you know, the, the topic we have here, dark forest black fly, only really works for Simulium nevi that likes to live in a forest. You need shaded areas, pristine environments, crabs which like vegetation and so forth. So it really is a dark forest and a black fly. But, but earlier you sh in the clip you showed uh, other parts of West Africa where you have a savanna species of black fly that doesn't have that niche. It, it breeds in open sun, hot areas, um, and uh, so that's a, a black fly, but in open light. So that, that you'd have to say open light black fly. Uh, that one flies hundreds of kilometers. It gets on, on uh, uh, the, uh, the various winds that occur Hamilton. over West Africa. Hamatan winds. Yeah, the Hamatan winds, and it'll, it'll go f up to 500 kilometers. So, a tr uh, so infected people 500 kilometers away can infect a black fly that'll fly and set up a cycle somewhere else. You can imagine how difficult that is. Now, this, this black fly we're talking about in Uganda only flies about five kilometers, and it has to hang around where the crabs are, obviously. If, it, if you have a black fly that wants to range out somewhere and, and happens to fly 10 kilometers and then can't find an area that has uh, any crabs, well, biologically, that black fly's finished. Uh, so it will not set up a transmission cycle that, that's valid. So really the, the strategy here of being able to go and find crabs and um, uh, focus your surveillance on what things look like for crabs to know what to do is really pretty unique to, I would say, Uganda, but let's not also forget the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which probably has about 30% of the Ankhosarkiasis in the world, and that's largely a Simulium nevi area. But the big issue is if you're having deforestation, although we hate to think of deforestation in terms of uh, the overall environmental changes that that brings, what one thing it does bring along with it is the loss of Simulium nevi, because you don't have the dark forests, you don't have the crabs often. So uh, as bad as deforestation is, you can get rid of that particular black fly. The bad news is with a niche change, you can have an invasion of the savanna form, so that actually you could have a new black fly coming in that rather than flying five kilometers, flies 100 kilometers. That's bad news. So uh, there are a lot of, this is a very dynamic situation biologically, epidemiologically, uh, entomologically, which is the study of, of uh, insects, uh, which, which makes the situation dynamic in Uganda. It's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. Uh, where we would wish to try and get rid of the situation with this parasite in the human population such that if there is a reinvasion of the area with a new kind of black fly, we don't suddenly find the problem worse rather than better. Right now, there are estimated to be 5 million people at risk um, uh, for river blindness right now in, uh, in Uganda. Based on the success of various programs, one in the 70s, the 1970s, using 
believe it or not, DDT uh, in an area uh, where back in the days when you could throw DDT in the, uh, in the water, uh, a lot less safe than the abate la uh, larvicide uh, that's being used by the Ministry of Health now in Uganda, um, the, uh, an entire area uh, in, in, around the Victoria now, uh, Nile was made clear of uh, river blindness, and it has not come back. Uh, so uh, Uganda has had uh, the technical experience and the successes in the past to want to uh, duplicate that success by going after uh, the elimination of river blindness in other areas. And in particular, the dark forest black fly species, Simulium nevi, the one with the crab, is the area where this vector uh, control, vector elimination effort is, is focused. Moses, can you say something about the progress that's been made in several zones already where river blindness has been eliminated? Where, um, and how much of a difference has that made in, in people's lives? Uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, Uganda started with control uh, with the help of River Blindness Foundation, later Carter Center that absorbed River Blindness Foundation, and then the African program for Nkosakai's control. Uh, much later, I think around 98. But the, 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 in 2007, Uganda decided that River Brani should be eliminated. And six foci were earmarked to begin from there and expand as we also uh, uh, improve, uh, increase our experience. Um, as we speak now, um, actually last, last August, we had a meeting, a technical meeting in Uganda, and three foresight uh, was, uh, a transmission in the three foresight where I was declared interrupted. So we started with six, Three are already declared interrupted. And we also have um, three uh, that we think, we, uh, they are, we, we say they are interruption is suspected um, achieved, isn't it? And, um, but it's because we, we haven't declared interruption because there is some data that we are required to provide by next August. <coughs> and personally, I'm confident that six have interrupted transmission. <laughs> and we are expanding to now bigger foci in the northern Uganda, uh, where there was conflict. And this area was not receiving ivermectin. There are about 500,000 people uh, you saw them in the film who are blind and we are launching the program there. Twice, we'll be providing ivermectin twice a year. And then in northwestern Uganda, we have done a study there and we have found that after 18 years of annual distribution of ivermectin, a single dose per year has failed to eliminate river blindness. So, that is also about 500,000 people. And so we are launching um, uh, in that area. And uh, there are other areas that are still being mapped uh, because we, we want to make sure that every village that is affected is reached. So those two big areas have also been mapped completely. And now we are launching there. So. Um, in terms of numbers, we can say that uh, about 400,000 people have been protected. Um, at least for the three, four side that I mentioned that the meeting agreed that we have done the job. And um, if we are to say treatments, we, are pro we have probably saved we, because we dropped this, we are no longer treating this year, from beginning with this year, uh, close to about 700. 700,000. About 700,000 treatments that are going to stop. 
and those people are already celebrating the elimination <laughs> of reefer blindness. But it's, it's sort of interesting if you were to, to look at a graphic on the aggregate number of treatments required in Uganda with ivermectin, those treatments are going to continue to go up. Yes. But what we're describing are different areas. Remember, the flight range is, is fairly restricted of these black flies. So you actually get discrete zones, uh, hot zones I was describing, uh, where you have to judge those areas uh, individually, epidemiologically. So if you were to break treatments out by each zone, you'd see some coming up, some coming down, some coming up, some coming down. But because of the peace that has been uh, achieved in northern Uganda, where there was conflict for so many years, there are a million people there who you showed in your film have terrible manifestations of river blindness who have never benefited from this medicine because you couldn't operate in those areas without a degree of risk. So if you were to, that is a whole new curve coming up only to be, uh, we're hoping next month, isn't it, yeah. to, to get ivermectin treatments um, mm -hmm. up and running there. Uh, Uganda has declared a goal of trying to stop river blindness, eliminate river blindness by the year 2020. The only way you're going to be able to do that is to treat more intensively with ivermectin twice per year. Uh, once per year often will not do it. Sometimes it will. Twice per year has a much better chance of getting it, uh, stopping the transmission by the black flies, preventing the black flies from picking up the microfilaria and taking them to other people. So uh, it, it's going to be a, a major challenge, but, but even with these successes, in an aggregate, treatments will be going up in Uganda before they start coming down. Yeah, I think it should be pointed out uh, again that the reason river blindness is so serious in the north is because of this civil conflict that's been going on for more than 20 years with the Lord's Resistance Army, where health programs, health services have been virtually non-existent for decades. So the people up there have suffered not only from river blindness, but from every other disease you can imagine. And peace has been restored to that region only recently. So that's why ivermectin has not been you know, distributed to these people and why so many people are blinded and suffering from you know, severe pathology as a result. Another thing I like to mention is that you know, the only other place besides Africa where river blindness is found is in the Americas, Central and Northern South America. We've got how many, con six countries? Six countries. Mm -hmm. Six countries, including Mexico, Guatemala, <coughs> and, and that took place because slaves brought the disease with them when they were exported to the Americas. And the interesting thing is that the slaves came over, they were hosts, they had the parasite in their bodies, and it took a different fly, different species of fly altogether, found only in that region to transmit that disease. So it's a very small percentage of people who've got the disease, but the program uh, of onchocerciasis control in the Americas has been working on this very seriously, and they expect to have the disease eliminated in the Americas, what, by 2015? Yeah, and, and it, again, it's, it, it comes back to the fact that if if you have um, uh, people who have the worms, but you don't have what we call a competent vector, it's finished. The, the, the worms will eventually die out, and no new people will get infected. Uh, and that's basically, I mean, you know, many, uh, many people came from Africa, obviously, who had the infection. But only a, a fraction of the black flies uh, that exist in this part of the world were, were capable of allowing the microfilaria to develop. They have to go through two stages to reach the infectious stage to be transmitted. And uh, that only occurs in, in two very focal areas. The, again, coming back to my love of biology, the interesting thing is that in the Americas, the black flies have teeth. And when they, when they suck blood, they like to chew. And that tends to chew up the parasite and reduce the possibility for a, a whole parasite to get in them, as opposed to in Africa where the, parasite, where the black flies like to suck. So uh, that inter interesting biological fact is probably why the parasite could not get established in places like the United States, and, and only a few places do you find the parasite in the Americas. 
It's time for our question and answer period now. If um, any of you have uh, any questions to ask us, please let us know. Here's a question from our uh, Twitter feed. Either Frank or Moses, can you give us um, um, a, a description of any memorable patient or health worker that you can recall um, from the campaign? Anyone whose life has been changed or who did particularly heroic service in the, in the cause? Well, I'll just say that, that one in, in Uganda, um, I, I can think of people in many different countries uh, whose lives have been affected. And I can actually think of, of uh, many kids who, uh, whose name is either Mectazan or Ivermectin, <laughs> named after, uh, uh, bec because um, actually you'll, you'll be amazed at, at what getting a good night's sleep and not scratching <laughs> will, will do for your, for your uh, love life. But, uh, <laughs> In, in Uganda, what was really fascinating was uh, we visited a compound in one of the foci called Itwara, one of the areas that, that has been eliminated now. Treatments uh, are ready to stop. And um, a, a woman named Marie brought out a pink blouse. I can remember it very well. And this, this, uh, this blouse w you, was, was like transparent. You could, it looked like it was very warm. And she said, when I, before the treatments began, I, I would scratch so much that I just literally uh, scratched through this, this blouse. And I've kept it to just remind myself when things get bad that they weren't, they're not like the days then. And uh, to hold this blouse up and just see the, the sun come through with just a few strands of threads left was, was very memorable for me. Aren't there some villages, Moses, where the children in the villages don't even know what river blindness is. Uh, school children uh, in the lower classes no longer know, uh, in some of these areas, no longer know uh, what river blindness is. They hear the name, but they don't know the disease. Um, but there is one, uh, one patient, um, an old man um, on Mount Eregon. We have a mountain called Eregon, Eastern Uganda. Uh, who had river blindness, and the community, his community were worried. They didn't know what it was, why he was changing. Um, the skin was changing, but actually he was involved in, um, in uh, lumbering, the, because there's a forest on the mountain, and he would go there and spend a long time there. And his skin changed. Um, he, he looks, actually he was on one of the clips, he looks like he's, uh, an, has an elephant skin, and uh, he had three wives, and all of these three wives left. And uh, now the worst thing in Africa is that if your kinsmen also say, we can't handle you, we don't know what is going on, then you know uh, it's bad. And so even his community rejected him. They didn't know what he was going to do to the whole community, and he had to go and leave in the forest alone until um, recently when the elimination was launched and they found him and they started giving him ivermectin, I think four times instead of twice. Um, now he's, he's better. I met him in Kampara in a suit mm. uh, <laughs> and his wives came back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but generally people will tell you uh, the men, uh, normally we look at women who say they are not married or they are divorced, but most men uh, in their 30s and above will tell you, when you came and brought this medicine, um, we thought we are impotent. And that means a lot to an African, because we love children. And, and, uh, and they, they, they almost literally carry you on their shoulders. Say, you did something for us. So, uh, the benefits are there, and you can see already people telling you that they can sleep, and um, uh, children go to school uh, before the schools would be empty because children are just scratching themselves. And I think I, I yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the talks tonight, and Weibele um, and I spent a couple of years in Uganda with the Peace Corps, uh, very near and dear to my heart. And 
the profound impact that the science has done is, is one thing, but I, I wish you would talk a little bit more, and Dachi, you just started to touch on it, <clears throat> about the social impact that disability has in the country and the opportunity that the campaign has provided to change maybe that social dynamic and any of the secondary uh, intended consequences that you've had in that regard. Thank you. I had, I think you said, where were you? Oh, he was saying thank you. That's, that's the language in central Uganda. Uh, okay, I, in northwestern Uganda, uh, people had vacated a very fertile, you can even look up on, on Google, you can Google a district called Zombo, S-Z-O-M-B-O, and people had vacated some of the most fertile areas because of Mombasa curses. And those who, had, who, those who vacated in 1993 had testified to me that they were not accepted, accepted by the rest of the society. Now they are back. And they, oh, the women always want to show me their skin. They look at my skin, it's beautiful. Before they were saying, oh, look what us, we are ashamed of, we can't even be accepted to go to the market because they think we are going to infect them. And sometimes they think it is uh, some demon or spirit that is causing all this. Because there is no, uh, Africans have um, traditional medicine, but for river blindness, no traditional medicine. But I, I would like to make, uh, I know we want to get to other, but the, the, the quick thing I would like to make, coming back to the distinction between control and eradication. You know, a a well-controlled river blindness situation is where no more blindness, no more itching, but the parasite's still around. So you know that if the black fly's still around, if treatment stop, you'll, you'll go back to where you were before. So it becomes a very big challenge. It's a challenge with this audience. You know, if, you, if, if somebody gives you antibiotics or something, you need, you, how often do you get through with you know, 12 or 14 days? Once you start feeling better, you stop. So people are like, why do we need to, keep, this medicine was great, it had its day, but why do we need to keep taking this medicine? Uh, our skin is better, et cetera. So you get into a whole new realm of health education uh, and, and really discussions with people on a different level about what needs to be done to reach elimination. And then it's usually nice to piggyback um, what we call integrate other efforts onto this, these programs against malaria with bed nets, against schistosomiasis and other, they use sort of the same approaches of, of distributing self and effective uh, safe and effective tools at the village level to, to keep the river blindness program going, but to, to hit other things that are perceived as an ongoing problem. That, that's a big challenge. We have another question over here. Thank you. Um, I'm very curious about the insect or the larvicide that you use, and I was wondering if you've observed any negative health or environmental impacts by using it. Uh, the, the larvicide that's used is called uh, Temophos or abate. It's, it's a, a very well-known, very well-studied um, larvicide that has a, um, a very short acting, it's actually um, quickly degraded in the environment. Um, it, uh, we're, we're dosing it at a, a, a the, luckily the black flies are ultra, they're larvae, they're aquatic stages uh, that you saw the larvae and pupae are, are very, very sensitive to this, so uh, a, an ultra-low dose can be used. As you could see, we're careful about the dosing. And the other thing to mention is um, that the, uh, well, I, I should also say abate is, is one of the few larvicides, it's the only one, actually, that's approved for drinking water. So, for example, this is what's used in the dengue campaigns uh, to get uh, at the mosquito that transmits dengue. It's actually breeds in, in water sources and houses, and, and little briquettes of abate are put in in drinking water sources. So it's, it's, it's about the safest uh, uh, larvicide that can be used at very low doses. The other important part is it's, it's fine if the black flies come back after the disease is gone, number one, and number two, because we're targeting it based on where we find infected crabs, we're not treating the entire ecosystem. So I think that's another important uh, element. There have been environmental impact studies done uh, that, that indicate that uh, at least no target, non-target fauna are being affected. But we, we don't like to keep this going very long. Usually you do monthly treatments for about six months and then go to, what, every three months? Yeah. And then you stop. 
uh, and that's, that's the general pattern. It doesn't go on ad infinitum. Another question here? Yes, my question is about the larva side as well. Um, because insects are highly adaptable and um, can easily become resistant to chemicals, are there other methods of vector control that are being implemented, such as pheromone traps, to control the black fly? Uh, great question. The, uh, well, there, the only really other larvicide that could be used um, that has very little to no environmental impact is BTI. You may be familiar with that. That's a, a, a Bacillus thuringiensis, Israeliensis compound that, that, uh, that's also very biodegrade. It's actually a biocontrol um, element. Luckily, we have not had to do that because the, the treatment cycles are so short for this black fly that's so sensitive. Um, uh, in, in these particular areas. Um, the, uh, uh, the other part of your question, I was going to say something else. Um, chemical I resistance. Remember. Ah, you were, you were asking about um, chemical resistance. In, in West Africa, where there was a very, very large program that went on for like 27 years, um, there, uh, where helicopters were actually used to put enormous amounts of, of larvicide, there, there was a great problem with black fly resistance. Um, and the fact that the black flies that were resistant could then pick up and fly 500 kilometers and set up um, a, a colony upstream or downstream, you can imagine how quickly that, that resistance would spread. So it was a very big problem there. Um, it has not been a problem with these localized flight ranged vectors that we have in Uganda. And, the, and the, 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 the chemical is really not targeting the adult fly. Yeah. It's targeting the, 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 the larval stages and for a short time. And then you are done. If you look at the, at the grubs and you find they are not infected, which doesn't take long, um, then you stop. So the, the, you use the chemical for a short time and it's only targeted for the larval stages. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it's really an honor. I'm a Ugandan. I'm one of four ILEP uh, fellows that are taking a semester on training in Clemson. I'm very grateful to Megan and Margaret for this opportunity. Um, I must confess about my ignorance, not only of the existence of this disease, but uh, the intervention programs that the government is actually taking to try to eradicate it in my country. I have three questions. The first one, you talked about vector control teams. I was wondering, are they fully trained medical personnel? And then how are they facilitated? And how often do they go out in the field to mm -hmm. control and monitor this disease? Secondly, um, have you done anything to recruit the people that were treated or affected by this disease in trying to raise awareness about it because ideally I would imagine that in my country most people would take this to be witchcraft which is uh, non far fetched Thank you very much. Okay, the, the personnel that are involved in uh, vector control or targeted vector control or elimination are personnel of Minister of Health. They are employees of Minister of Health and district local governments. Um, they are not medical doctors or what. They are entomologists, they are biologists. And uh, as I told you, you know our country, you have one doctor to more than 20,000 people and if they don't come to USA, go to Europe for greener pastures mm. <laughs> because most of them are going out of the country. And so we, what the Carter Center does is to get those who, are, who have exper experience to train those who have no experience. And you do it on the job, in the forest, like how you saw it in the film. And then uh, once they, ha they, they, are, they have acquired enough experience, then you split these teams uh, 
putting the experienced ones in each of the teams and then assign them an area where they will be operating. And so they are multiplying what they call the surveillance teams. And then they have also a national surveillance team. Now what the CATA Center does is to provide all the uh, equipment they need. We also provide transportation and and uh, when the local government or the Minister of Health has not provided per diems, we provide per diems for those teams. We have also, we have a, a molecular lab which the Carter Center assisted in setting up at Vector Control Division of Minister of Health. It's on Uganda Road if you are Ugandan. Um, and uh, it's a molecular lab that is doing PCR and uh, testing uh, whether elimination has been attained in some of these foci. And these are Ministry of Health personnel that Carter Center has brought some of them to USA and sponsored their training. Uh, and a gentleman called Dr. Tom Yunash in the University of South, South Florida, uh, he has been helping us also in quality control of this lab. So, um, yes, now about health education, we, the Minister of Health together with the Carter Center puts out messages periodically on radio and TV, but in the communities where there is river blindness, uh, there are flip charts, there are training guides, and training is done at the kinship level, clan level. And it, it's not done just at the district and you go blowing the, uh, what, uh, 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 some, some loudspeaker, no. You just sit under a tree and train the kinship people and give health education and they select their distributors and you train them. Just, I, I think there, if I could just say one thing. I mean, just, I think you should, you should be very proud as Ugandans in terms of the accomplishments that have been made. I mean, this is a Ugandan program. Uh, these are Ugandan human resources that, uh, that have been, that are really, uh, the best trained vector people that, uh, if not in, in all of Africa, in certainly Africa. in East Africa, and the political leadership and vision is Ugandan. Um, so this is a Ugandan program. We're really pleased to be helping, but um, you know, my hat's off to, to the vision of the Ugandans, and I, I would say uh, from our perspective here in the United States uh, that, that this should be seen as, um, as, as really an encouraging story uh, one that, that, that we should, should uh, be willing to, to follow the leadership and do what we can and, and try and, and, and lose some of our opinions of, of things can't get done on the continent to move to the, to the fact that we're moving to a better day in, in both political as well as uh, uh, health and, and development. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really very, very optimistic and hope that you can come away optimistic about about this is one little story uh, amidst many stories that are happening right now, not only in Uganda, but on the rest of the continent. Okay, unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, if you have any additional questions you'd like to ask, uh, we may be able to answer them personally after, after Craig uh, has his final remarks. Thank you, it's unfortunate we have to bring this to a close because uh, I know there's a lot of interest there. This does conclude our webcast for this evening. I'd like to thank the panelists for their work and Mr. Stryker for bringing important global health issues to light through his news reporting. If you're watching us online and you've liked what you've seen, remember you can watch this program along with any of our past conversation events on our website, www.cartercenter.org. Our next and final conversations at the Carter Center for this season will take place on April 19th and will cover the Arab Awakening. If you want to be sure you're getting the latest news about conversations or other Carter Center events and programs, sign up for uh, emails on our website, join us on our Facebook fan group, or follow us on Twitter. Um, thank you. And good night. Thanks for coming.